so good morning. I know it's kind of, you know, it's relatively early, so I'm going to wake you up. <laughs> All right. So you're in the, you're in the super fun session. This could be great. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Danica Fine. I am a developer advocate for Confluent. And so basically what that means is that I love Apache Kafka and I'm here to tell you about it in probably the most exciting way that you will ever encounter for Kafka. So um, before we get into it, you know, the goal of today is to um, so that everyone can walk away from the session, at least knowing what Apache Kafka is, all the fundamental components of it, and so you're a little more familiar when the next time it comes up, so you know how to start get started with it, right? Um, and before we get into that, how many of you have heard of Kafka before? Okay, so how many of you are using it? Okay, a couple, okay, all right. So by the end, you're all gonna be ready <laughs> for Apache Kafka. Um, and so before we actually get into the individual components of Kafka, and there are many, <laughs> there are many, um, I wanted to start with a little bit of motivation, right? Because I think it's a lot easier if we're all on the same page uh, before we dive into the, the technical details, okay? So why? Why should we care about Apache Kafka? Um, you've heard of it, obviously, you know, it is a pretty popular technology, especially over the last uh, five or 10 years, it's gaining in momentum. Um, but it is a, a general platform for streaming data, okay? And so there's a lot of really, really good reasons for you to start using Apache Kafka, but I think the most compelling one is that this idea of real time makes sense, right? We're, we've moved on from batch processing. I mean, yeah, there's still a lot of use cases where batch is fine, but I think it's better to prepare for the use cases where you need things to happen right now, instantaneously, in an event-driven way, versus architecting for batch and then trying to speed things up later, right? Um, so instead of building systems for batch by default, we're instead moving to this, this real time, we're shifting to this, okay? Uh, so we're not really processing data in a way where we are uh, grouping events or data by minutes, hours, days, weeks even. I used to work in finance, so I understand like processes that took weeks at a time, uh, or you know, end of quarter processes, right? Um, and instead, we're, again, like I said, architecting for um, building systems that react to smaller amounts of data in real time as they occur, or as close to when they occur as possible, okay? So Kafka is a technology that allows you to do this um, and allows you to tap into real-time stream processing, right? Not just moving this data in real time, but being able to react to it in real time. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to doing this. Okay, uh, it's not just making it faster. We can actually get a lot of cool things out of doing it faster and architecting it further this way. Uh, you can increase the accuracy of your data and your results. Um, you're obviously building a more reactive system, which is good. Um, and then in some cases, in some technologies that you use for uh, stream processing, you can actually increase the resiliency of the system, which might not make sense at the get-go, but you actually do get a lot of cool things out of architecting for real time. Okay, so Kafka is one of many technologies that allow you to do this. Um, it can serve as a messaging system. If you've dealt with like messaging queues in the past, uh, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, Kafka can serve as a persistent storage layer. As you're moving your data in real time, you can also store it for indefinite amounts of time. Um, and then also we'll see there's, there's capabilities for processing that data later on, okay? And again, Kafka is just one of these technologies. There's a lot of them out there. But I think the really, really cool thing about Kafka versus some other technologies for stream processing is that Kafka's really flexible in what you can get out of it, okay? We're not just uh, cornering ourselves into getting message queuing functionality. We can get pub sub, we can get broadcasting capabilities. And so the cool thing about Kafka is that as you're dealing with this sort of real-time processing, um, you can have different use cases consuming that exact same data and doing completely different things with it, okay? So we're not doing a sort of queuing functionality where only one process or application can consume an individual data point uh, at a time, uh, we can instead build uh, completely different uh, downstream systems that consume that same data and make use of it. So write once, read many, many times, right? So that is Kafka sort of in a nutshell. So let's get into the important parts, how to actually use it. What are the components of it? Um, but before we get into, again, I keep pushing it off. Before we get into the actual components, there's a really, really big part of Kafka that you need to understand before you can get to Kafka itself. And that, are, that is events, okay? So events are critical when you're dealing with Kafka. Um, and Kafka, if you look at sort of the tagline definition of what Apache Kafka is, it is an event, a distributed event streaming platform, okay? So it's in the definition. We need to understand what events are to really get the most out of Apache Kafka. And so I'm gonna preface this 
<laughs> by saying that I'm not asking you to re-architect how you think about uh, technology, right? Uh, asking you to think in events isn't that big of an ask, I promise, right? Because as humans, as programmers, as users, you already fundamentally know what events are. It's baked into how we react to things in real life, okay? Every time you get a message on your phone, every time you look at an application log file to debug something, um, these are all events, okay? So that's, you know, we, we interact with them in real life. We know what they are. We just have to think about it now when we start to architect our systems, when we model our data, okay? So those are some high level examples of events, but what is an event actually? Well, this is really, really important here. It's just a thing that happened. That's it, that's an event, okay? It's like, it's not a, a mind blowing new way to think about stuff. It's just, okay, something happened. So what do we need to know to describe something that's happened? Well, we need to know when that thing occurred. That's probably the most important thing. What, what's the timestamp on this thing that happened? And then we need to know who or what was involved and any other supporting details to make sense of that thing. And you'll also, if you look up events and try to uh, you know, get more of a textbook definition of it, uh, you'll also see it described as events are a combination of notification and state, right? I am notifying you at this timestamp that something happened. And here, is, here are the details. Here's the state that you need to actually react to the fact that this thing occurred, yeah? And so to keep, you know, to solidify this even more, an event can be anything, right? We're not just talking about one specific industry. Uh, we're going to cross all uh, different industries with events because it's just something that occurred, right? So for e-commerce, you know, the act of adding something to your cart, that's, that's an event. Um, for like shipping and logistics, where is this ship currently located on the open sea? Cool, that's an event. Um, I don't know, the act of calling and placing a pizza order, that's, that's an event, okay. But regardless of what your events actually are, a really, really important part of them is that they're meant to be immutable. And I know immutability, not everyone likes that, okay? We like our object-oriented way of, uh, of, of our paradigm. Um, and it's really nice to think about, you know, to have the flexibility to change things, to update state. But that goes, that's at odds with what events are fundamentally, because an event is a thing that has occurred in the past. That happened, done. I don't have a time machine. I'm not going to go back and undo the fact that I made that, uh, I called and ordered 42 pizzas. Maybe I didn't really mean to order 42 pizzas, but I, I made that order, right? It's on me. It happened, okay? Um, but does that mean that we can't ever, you know, make mistakes and undo them, right? Maybe I regret ordering 42 pizzas, okay? I didn't really want that. Um, but the fact that we have an event saying that I made that order doesn't mean that we can't ever undo it, right? Events can be undone. If we go back to these examples, like I added something to my cart, well, Eh, maybe I didn't want to add all of those things to my cart. Uh, it was a moment of weakness. I added 4,000 things to my cart one night and realized I can't afford that. Uh, we can undo that. We can remove things from our carts, right? It would be really silly if we didn't allow people to do that. <laughs> um, in the shipping example, a ship can go back, a vessel can go back to a previous location. That's completely fine. It just reverse. I guess it's a little more complicated than that, but it can go back, right? And I could call that pizza joint and say, hey, that was a mistake. I actually only need two pizzas, not 42. That's ridiculous. Like you can go and change those things. But when you think about it, that's not really uh, at odds with what events are, you know, right? The, the, these, these acts of undoing these events or changing the previous events are also events, right? Because at a certain timestamp, I'm going to go in and update my cart, right? At another later timestamp, that ship's going to go back to where it was. At a later timestamp, I'm going to call and amend my pizza order, right? So we're never really getting rid of events. We're never changing events. We're instead just adding new events that over time describe a specific entity, okay? And the, you know, so all of these new events, all these updates are, you know, themselves events. And in a lot of cases, in most cases, what the old events were are also still relevant right, in order for you to keep track of what's going on in your system and how you describe your entities over time. Okay, so over time, as, uh, as events are generated for a given entity, and an entity can be anything, right, the, the cart ID um, for our, the vessel ID of that ship, or for our pizza order, pizza ID, right, we want to keep track of these events and how they alter these entities. Um, and so as new events flow in over time, we're just adding them to 
uh, a stream of immutable facts that describe that entity over time. Okay, so then we get sort of this timeline, this lovely little uh, timeline of events that describe this thing. So when you work with Apache Kafka, you are, or should be, uh, writing data as events. Um, not everyone follows that pattern. That is uh, a talk on its own, <laughs> if you want to um, argue that. Um, but the bottom line is that if you want to use Kafka to its fullest, you should probably be thinking in events. Okay, things that occur, we have a timestamp, yeah? Um, as we go through the rest of this talk and look more into the components, you're going to hear two uh, words, uh, de definitely. Uh, you're going to hear message, you're going to hear records, okay? Um, these are fundamental components in Kafka. Um, if you are following best practices and using events, records and messages are, for the most part, synonymous with events. Um, I know when we, I feel like this is, this is the case in any technology, at a certain point you just start like uh, using words interchangeably and it might not make sense to people who are outside of that technology. So I just want to give you the insider scoop here. <laughs> like, we're going to use all these terms effectively interchangeably. Um, but to give you the sort of the nuance, uh, the data that we are writing to Kafka should be an event or represent an event, a thing that occurred. Um, but to get that data into Kafka, as we'll see later, we're going to be using a producing client that's going to send a message or a record containing that event. Okay, so they're kind of nested, but at a certain point, uh, the nesting doesn't really matter too much, and we can use all these terms effectively interchangeably. Um, and so, yeah, I will be using message and record definitely interchangeably as we go through this. So just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so now we understand events. And that's like, if you, if you walk away with nothing else, like that's probably the most important part. It's like, what is an event? How do we architect for that? Um, and you're golden, effectively. Like any uh, sort of real-time processing uh, technology is going to more or less be dealing with events. So you're good to go. But please stick around because Kafka's kind of cool too. Um, but now that we understand what events are, it's you know probably be good to understand how we're actually storing this data in Kafka because these events have to go somewhere. And you could, and maybe for those of you who ha you have said that maybe yeah, you're using Kafka, it's very, very easy to treat Kafka like a black box. Here, take my data and later I'll get it out. Yeah, but it's really, really worthwhile knowing how things actually operate in Kafka, because then you can start to optimize, right? So the primary unit of storage in Kafka is called a Kafka topic, and topics just represent a, a single data set of events. So the cool thing, okay, not the cool thing, a thing about the topic is that um, events are written in order. And then as you write events to the Kafka topic, each event is going to be appended to the end. You'll notice that as we write these events, um, they also have a number associated with it. Um, it's going to have a monotonically increasing number called an offset associated with every event that we write into the Kafka topic. Um, this is really important for helping us to identify exactly where each event lives in this Kafka topic. Where are they relative to other events? And this is important for helping our consuming applications later on so that they know where they've left off. Okay, so they keep track of this offset. And so, so far as we're adding these events to this topic, you know, it looks a little boring. And you might, you might think that this looks familiar. Like maybe that's, that's a queue, right? We've learned about queues. We all, we all understand what those are. Um, but I'm going to nip that in the bud, <laughs> all right? Kafka topics are not queues, okay? There is a fundamental disconnect between what these two data structures actually are. What does a queue mean versus, versus what is a topic? And a Kafka topic is a log data structure, okay? So those are very, very different. Um, the key distinction between queues and logs is that, you know, usually when you read data from a queue, you, you pop it off the end of the queue and it's gone, right? You're just kind of, uh, you're queuing up to do some processing on it and then after that, you know, it's ephemeral. We're not trying to maintain that data anywhere. But in a log, it is a log, right? Think of a log file as you add events to it. We're never gonna get rid of that data because what happened at 12.44 p.m. yesterday is kind of important. We won't, we're not gonna go in and say, you know what, I didn't like what happened there at 12.44, we're gonna get rid of it. No, once the data is written in the log, it is there, okay? So the same thing is true of a Kafka topic, okay? The data is in there. So they are uh, you know, long living data structures. We can configure how long the data lives in the log, but we're never gonna go in and like pop off you know, specific events and get rid of them from the middle of the topic. Right. They are there for some configurable amount of time um, or for some time based, uh, space based component that we might want to clean up old data. Okay. 
Um, another thing to keep in mind as we deal with topics um, is that the topics themselves are also immutable, right? Again, we're not going to go in at some random space like, say, event three was my erroneous uh, pizza order of my 42 pizzas. That's unfortunate because, hey, it's in there. <laughs> Other things have been written afterwards. It's kind of difficult for me to, you know, peek in there and, and get rid of an event because that's number three. But four comes after it and two's there and we don't want to have just have like a random spot in the middle of the topic where that event no longer is. Um, so we want this whole, posi you know, the positioning and the timeline of these events to be respected and be maintained in this Kafka topic. That's not to say that, you know, I can't, again, call and update that pizza order. And in doing so, I'm going to create that new event and append it to, to the end of that topic. Three is still in there, that initial pizza order, great, but I have since updated it, okay? And it's good to maintain that history, okay? So to summarize, um, you know, the primary storage structure in Kafka is this Kafka topic. Um, it's a durable, immutable, append-only log where we can keep all of our events uh, for any, you know, time-based, uh, you know, configurable time-based uh, amount. Okay. So we don't actually stop at the topic level. It gets better. Um, so topics are broken down into smaller components called partitions. Um, so everything that you just learned about the topic is also going to apply at the partition level. So new data in a, in a partition is going to be appended to the end of that partition. Um, every record or event is going to be assigned an offset that's actually unique within that topic partition. So you'll see that we have the ones you know, repeated across these three partitions. That's fine because when we actually refer to an event, we refer to it at, uh, within its partition and then by its offset as well. So it's kind of like a, uh, an aggregate key there. Okay? And the offsets are really important at the partition level because, and if you want this functionality, it's great that we have it, um, events are guaranteed to be ordered within the partition. Okay? Not across partitions, but within the partition, if you are processing events simply from you know, that first partition, um, you can guarantee that, that those records are ordered. Okay? So here we have a Kafka topic with uh, three partitions. And typically the data is gonna be split up um, based on the key of the message. That's sort of the default functionality. Um, in this case, you might say that we assign the key based on you know, the color of these Lego bricks. Right? <laughs> Um, this isn't always the case. There are some use cases where you don't need that keying uh, and, and partitioning functionality like that. Um, and there's a lot of different strategies that you can employ. It's flexible. You don't need to use the keys. Uh, you can still, you can distribute the data evenly just based on the number of events if you'd like to. Um, there's a lot of flexible ways that you can partition your data. So now you understand how data is actually stored, what the, the storage structure is, um, you know, in our Kafka topics and more specifically in our partitions. You could go about your life using Kafka with just this base level knowledge and do pretty okay, right? We're gonna store data in our, in our Kafka topics. It's gonna be doled out across one of these partitions and later on we can consume it. Cool, but partitions are important, okay? There's a lot of cool things that we get uh, from the fact that we are partitioning our data. Um, and I do wanna highlight a couple of those before we go a little further. So first and foremost, Kafka is a distributed system. For better or for worse, this is what we've got. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna try to make the most out of the fact that it's distributed. Um, so by breaking up that Kafka topic into multiple partitions, we are able to uh, put those partitions on different machines in the Kafka cluster, different nodes across the cluster. And by doing so, you know, splitting up this data, this is ultimately how our cluster and all of our applications are gonna scale in the end. Um, so generally speaking, the more partitions you have, uh, the, the more you can horizontally scale out your consuming applications. And that's, for the most part, a good thing. Um, but you don't want to go too far. You know, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Um, so having too uh, many partitions can be just as bad as having too few when it comes to reading that data later on. Um, there are entire talks and blogs specifically on choosing the right number of partitions for your application. Um, so if you're curious about that, I will point you to those resources because that is... Yeah, like I said, a lot of information in and of itself. Um, but generally, you want to choose a number of partitions that um, is divisible by many different numbers, right? Um, so that you can evenly split up those partitions across uh, any number of consuming applications later on, and we will see that in just a minute. But how are these partitions actually distributed across the cluster, you might be asking. So again, it's a distributed system. Um, so we have a cluster of nodes to make up a Kafka cluster, right? Um, these nodes are called brokers. They can be bare metal, uh, VMs in the cloud, containers, doesn't matter where you're running them, just run them somewhere, okay? So this is a simple Kafka cluster. 
Um, we have three nodes here. Um, and we're also just going to store, we have three topics, each with some number of partitions, right? Your results may vary, but this is uh, definitely one way that the partitions could be distributed across this cluster. And you might note that, yeah, for the most part, it's pretty even, right? We are trying our best to distribute the partitions across the cluster as evenly as possible. And you also see that, uh, as an example, for topic B, which has three partitions, uh, each of those partition li partitions lives on a different node in the cluster, okay? That's not by chance. Kafka is going to do its best to balance those partitions for a given topic across as many nodes as possible, okay? Because we never want one broker to be burdened with handling all the data for a single topic, okay? Um, and the reason for that is both from the produce side of things and the consume side of things. So if one broker has to handle every partition for topic B, well, okay, that could be, you know, millions of messages, you know, per day, billions per day, and that's kind of unfortunate if that one broker has to deal with all of that, right? And also from the consume side of things, um, we never want one broker to have to serve up all of the data at once, okay? It's just not efficient, okay? Um, and the partitions are how we actually uh, parallelize the processing of data later on. So again, it's way more efficient um, and more optimal if, say, we, for topic B, if we have three consumers consuming one each of those partitions, um, then each of those consumers is going to connect to just one broker to receive that data. And again, we're not inundating one broker with all of those requests. Okay. Um, so again, the goal really is to just distribute your data as evenly across the partition as pos uh, across the cluster as possible. And so this is great. This is pretty optimal. Um, but we have to consider what happens when our intern trips on a wire and a, bro uh, a broker goes down, right? Because that will happen. It might not be anybody's fault, but something's going to happen, and we're going to lose some data. Um, this is not ideal. <laughs> we obviously don't want to lose any data. Um, but the good news is, is that we only lost a third of our data. It could have been a lot worse, yeah? Um, but we're not going to stop there, OK? That's still unfortunate. We lost uh, three of our partitions worth of data. So Kafka is going to take this a step further with a, a built-in uh, feature called replication. Okay, so replication is just a configuration that defines how many copies of a given partition is going to exist across the cluster. Okay, so we can avoid that situation. And so here, we're going to look at, again, this three-node uh, uh, three cluster with one from the perspective of one topic that has three partitions. And we're going to enable a replication factor of three, which is the default in Kafka. So when replication is enabled, when data is first produced to a partition, say that we are writing data to partition zero, which lives on broker zero, we're first going to connect to broker zero and write that data to that partition. And then synchronously, Kafka, the cluster, is going to replicate that data over to where those follower uh, replicas live on other brokers, OK? So this is also important, is that our leader partition, our main, our golden copy of the data lives for partition zero, lives on broker zero. And then the other copies, the replicas, live not on broker zero, OK? We don't want the copies to live on the same broker. That would defeat the purpose. Um, so here you see that we have the two replica, the follower replicas on brokers one and two, OK? And so now, when we lose that node, OK, well, we lost our lead partition uh, for partition zero. And that's really unfortunate because that was the one that our producers were writing to and our consumers were reading from. Okay, no good. But as soon as we realize that that uh, node is gone, Kafka is going to rebalance. It's going to run a, an election process and it's going to look at, okay, where are our followers? What nodes do they live on? Great, let's promote one of them. Okay, so within a couple milliseconds, the cluster is going to realize and it's going to elect uh, one of the followers uh, to be the new leader, and our consumers and producers can keep operating as they were. Okay, so this is built in. I know that was kind of an aside, but I just want to show that, like, yeah, even in this distributed system, like Kafka is doing uh, a lot of heavy lifting to make sure that your data is going to be there for you, it's going to be available, um, so that it can serve up your immutable events for your processing later on. Okay, so <laughs> now we can understand where the data is stored, how it's stored. Now we can sort of understand how the records. Uh, how we build up these records. Where are we putting these events? How are we formatting them to get them into Kafka? And the bottom line is that it depends. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, there's optional fields and required fields when you're building up a record to store it in Kafka. Um, as far as the required fields go, pretty minimal. All we need to know is what topic do we want to store this data in, right? Where is this, what's this data set? And then what is the piece of data we want to store? It's that simple. That's it. You can start putting it into Kafka. Um, so the value there is the event itself. 
okay? Optional fields, there are many. You have options. Um, so you could include the specific partition that you want to store that data on. So if you're doing your own sort of hashing to figure out where you're mapping your events uh, you know, to the specific partitions, you're free to do that and compute the partition on your own. Um, if you don't include a partition, that's fine. Kafka's going to use the built-in functionality to um, either take your key and hash it itself and compute that, um, or you know, distribute it evenly if that's the functionality you want. Um, you can also include a timestamp. Um, if you don't include a timestamp, uh, Kafka, the producer, is just going to use the system time of the current machine that's running on, so now. Um, but you can go back if you need to write historic events. You can override the timestamp if you'd like. You can also include a key. Again, not you don't, you don't need to if you don't need the key uh, in your processing, but this is um, how if you don't include a partition, you know, using the key is probably very helpful. And then there's also some optional headers that you can include in the messaging as well. Um, we use these headers for you know, tracing if you need the distributed tracing um, on your applications. And so let's actually build up a record now. So let's say I'm on lego.com, um, I'm shopping. Um, I'm gonna use their pick a brick feature, which is really great to, to buy new, uh, just individual pieces. Um, and I just added this uh, blue one by one plate to my cart. So what does this record actually look like, right? We wanna keep track of what's happening with my carts. What does this mean? So as far as like, okay, what, what topic are we writing to? Well, I'm probably keeping track of all of the cart updates across the website, right? So we should be storing that in the cart updates topic. That makes sense. Uh, getting real original here. Um, as far as the value, what is the event? Okay, I'm gonna say like at some timestamp, I added this one uh, blue one by one plate to my cart, okay? And that's it, that's the event. If I want some more information, I should probably include what's the cart ID? Because it was my cart, I didn't add it to some general cart on the website, it was my own. So cart one, two, three, four, as an example. Now what about the optional fields? Um, I am a fan of letting Kafka do what Kafka does well, and that is you know, choosing the partitions um, and you know, manually inserting those timestamps because where I don't have to override things and insert a, a, a human mistake, <laughs> that's probably better. So I'm not going to override the partition. I'm not gonna override the timestamp. I'm gonna use the system time, and we're going to then, for the uh, computing the partition, we're going to use the key to do that. Um, and the key here, I'm going to choose to be the cart ID, okay? Um, and that's so that when we're doing any analysis later on, when we're actually building uh, systems on top of these events, uh, we're doing it at the, you know, the individual user level effectively. Like I wanna keep track of what I've done with my cart, not anybody else's, okay? And I'm not gonna include any he headers. So now we can take that event um, and set up a producer client, which um, Kafka is really great because it's very, very flexible in what language you can use. I mean, it's originally uh, a Java, um, you know, JVM uh, based clients. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, C++, Python, um, and, and what have you. The list goes on and on and on. Um, so you're pretty flexible in what producers you can write. Um, so we can take that event, that record, and write it in Kafka. Cool. Well, not quite, okay? There's one more caveat that we have, one more step we have to go through before we can actually get that data into Kafka. And the thing is that brokers speak in bytes. They don't care about that nice little record that we just built up that's human readable and our, you know, the object that we spent and that class that we created to build up these objects. It doesn't care. The broker only wants to store bytes. It does not want your cute object, all right? So it's a lot more efficient for brokers to do this because then they can take a, you know, a huge chunk of bytes and just store it in the log. They don't have to worry about um, you know, parsing out that information. It's more efficient, all right? So, we, in order to translate that object into bytes, we need a serializer, okay? Um, and so commonly supported formats, um, Avro, I think is the biggest one, JSON, Protobuf, um, we're working on uh, using Parquet as well for Kafka, so you have a lot of flexibility in the serialization format that you wanna use. Um, and so all you need to do once you've chosen a serialization format is you know, configure your producer to use the proper serializer based on your object and your format, okay? and then you'll use a corresponding deserializer later on when you want to read that data out. So ultimately what this means, and here's a big best practice alert, uh, use schemas, right? They're gonna save you a lot of headaches later on. It takes like five minutes to think of a schema and then you make sure that your data looks good. Um, and then, you know, if someone tries to mess it up, at least it's a little bit harder for them to write bad data into your, into your cluster, so that would be good. Um, 
So yeah, this is also like if you're already set on taking that little uh, tidbit on events with you, also take this one with you. Schemas are great. Please use them. Um, so yeah, by having a schema, we're basically enforcing like this is what I want my data to look like. It's a contract, at least from the producer side of things, the producer and the broker. Okay, the producer knows that that data should look like this before it writes it into the Kafka topic. And you might be asking yourself, um, you know, it's one thing to um, you know, to know what the data sh should look like, and it's another thing entirely to enforce that. Yeah, and so that's that's a good point, and we will get to that. We have some other tools built in that actually help to enforce and make sure that you're not going to get bad data into your topic. Okay, but we'll get there in a little bit. Um, but let's get this record into Kafka, right? So as sort of like a summary, this is this is the event that we're trying to write. Yeah, we have our key, cart one, two, three, four. Uh, we have some of that information uh, reiterated here. We are adding uh, something to the cart. Um, this is a specific element ID, and here's the description of it. And we just want to add one, right? So we can configure our producer with the correct serializer for this object, and then we can write it into our Kafka topic. But I also want to highlight some of the cool things that the producer does for you. Okay, so yeah, you basically you take that object, your producer's configured. It's going to, you call like producer.send, it's going to write that data into Kafka. But there's a lot of things that the producer does for you that you don't necessarily think about. Okay, so the first thing it's doing, right, based on the configuration, is it's serializing that event into raw bytes. Then they're going to compute the partition, right? Because partitioning, it, you know, choosing your partition is optional. And so the producer, if you don't include a partition, is going to figure out what partition um, that record should go into. And then to be a little more efficient, since we have this chunk of bytes destined for a specific partition, the producer is going to wait a little bit to see if there are other events destined for the same partition. Because it's a lot more efficient for it to group data together and send a whole chunk of bytes over to the broker than it is to make individual calls. Okay? Um, so this is fully configurable, how long you actually wait to, uh, to, before you send a batch. Um, and again, that's a whole talk on its own, um, but you, this is a you know, functionality that's available to you to be a little more efficient. And then we can compress that data optionally um, if you want to make sure that it's just you know, that much more efficient when it goes onto broker. And then finally, the producer will issue a request to the broker to store this chunk of data on a specific partition. And so now that record, that act of adding that item to my cart will appear on the cart updates topic. But storing the data in Kafka is just half of it, right? It gets way more interesting when we read it out and start doing something with the information, right? Because we don't really care about uh, the producing the data in real time. It's really what are we doing with that information as quickly as possible, okay? And we're gonna do that with consumers. They're great, so good. Um, so how does consuming data in Kafka work? Again, you can operate, uh, you know, treat Kafka as a black box and just write data in and consume data out, but I think it's really worthwhile to understand the nuances and what actually happens when your consuming applications are getting that data out of Kafka. So when a consumer is first started up, you know, we have our card updates topic and we want to start an application to make sense of that data, right? Maybe we're doing an anal a long-term analysis to understand um, or maybe build up a model of, you know, can we anticipate what someone's gonna do with their cart? Or maybe we're trying to, um, you know, if something has been added to a cart but it's been sitting there for a while, maybe we have a consumer application that sends out specific coupons based on what's in the cart or whatnot. So there's a lot of different things we could be doing. Um, <clears throat> but hey, we're starting up a consuming application, doesn't matter what the business logic is, and we wanna read through this data. So how do we start? Well, it's a new consumer. And so when you start up a new consumer, you need to think about where are we starting in the topic? Okay, so consumers have two options. We're either going to start at the most recent event that was written in the topic, or you can start at the beginning. And since, for my use case, let's say, we're trying to understand just over for the entire history of card updates that we have, just so we get the most information, we're going to start at the beginning of the topic here. Okay? So the first event that this consumer is going to read is event number one with offset number one. And it's going to do whatever business logic it has, um, and then it's going to process the next record. Cool, right? Um, every so often, the consumer is going to do a little bit of bookkeeping, and it's going to report back to Kafka and say what event it's seen most recently. Which one has it finished processing? Okay. And again, this offset, you know, where this consumer has left off, is going to be stored back in Kafka. Okay. And it's specifically going to say, for say partition zero, I've made it to offset two. And it's going to do that for all of the partitions that it's currently consuming from. 
And the reason that this is doing it is that um, if it goes down for any reason, later on it can start back up and it knows exactly where it left off. All right? So the consumer is going to do its thing and read its events and you know, process, you know, implement whatever business logic it has. And while it's doing that, the producer can do whatever it wants to do. Okay? They're completely decoupled from one another, and that's wonderful. We like that. We want a loosely coupled system. Um, so again, like maybe the consumer has you know, a, lot, uh, a lot of heavy lifting to do in its side of things. We don't have to worry about that impacting the producer at all. Okay? Um, again, it's going to keep operating. Um, update its off to the pre, maybe. Oh, oh gosh. Well, that sucks. Um, so, okay, our consumer inevitably will die. <laughs> Something will happen. Maybe it's on purpose, maybe we're restarting machine, but that consumer is gone, okay? And that's really unfortunate, because that consumer can't uh, keep processing in the way that it was, but um, the good news is the producer can keep going. It doesn't care, okay? Again, fully decoupled, the producers are going to keep working regardless of who is consuming that information. And on the other side of things, consumers can be configured to uh, keep waiting for new events, uh, even if there's no producer, okay? So when the consumer comes back up, hopefully, <laughs> uh, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to request its offsets from Kafka, and it's going to know exactly where it left off for that specific set of partitions. Um, and so, yeah, I saw t part uh, event number three most recently, and all right, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to start number four now, all right? Um, and so, and we're going to keep operating in this way. So, the way that one consumer works is also the same uh, same way that we can implement multiple consumers. And you know, I said that the producers are decoupled from the consumers. Well, the consumers are also completely decoupled from one another. Okay, so you can treat these consumers as completely different applications, right? Maybe one of them is you know, consumer one is going through these updates and making sure we have the right inventory. Maybe the next one is updating that model to understand like predictive, how do we anticipate what the, what the user's gonna do next based on their history. And maybe the, um, the last one here um, is going through that, you know, some other use case, right? They're doing completely different things. They can operate at their own pace and they're not gonna impact one another. And most importantly, because Kafka is not a queue, that data is there, right? They're not gonna impact one another. Okay. But there's more, you know, those consumers are decoupled from one another, but what if you want them to be coupled? Sometimes that's nice, okay? Um, so we can bring consumers together as part of a consumer group um, and couple them so that we can parallelize the processing of data from a single Kafka topic based on partitions, okay? Um, so they do this by forming a consumer group. Um, you, you, it's just a configuration that you use on your consumers. You give all of them the same consumer group ID, and when they start up, they will start to share the work of processing that data. They will be given a partition assignment um, from the consumer group coordinator, which is you know, something happening on the broker. Um, so it's out, outside of your control. You don't have to worry about it. It's automatic. Um, and so say we've started up consumer one, and we have this three partition topic, right? If I only have consumer one operating, well, it's going to be assigned all three partitions to read from. And maybe that's fine for, you know, for the use case right now. But what if we suddenly get a million orders at once or a million cart updates? And that's simply not enough. So we add a second consumer. Well, when that second consumer comes online with the same consumer group ID, the consumer group coordinator says, all right, I have to give some partitions to this consumer now. And so it's going to take, uh, in this case, partition one and give it to that second consumer. But we can keep going, we can add a third consumer. And at this point, we've reached peak parallelism, right? We have three partitions, we have three consumers. Each consumer has one partition to consume from. Um, and this is an important thing to keep in mind is that within a consumer group, we're always gonna have a one-to-one -one mapping of partitions to consumers, okay? Across different consumer groups, that's great. We could have multiple you know, partitions assigned to multiple consumers and that's fine. But here, we only ever have one consumer, one partition assigned to each, uh, sorry. Every partition is only going to be assigned to, to one consumer, okay? So for you know, a single event in partition two um, is only going to be seen by part, uh, consumer three at this point. It's not going to be seen by any of the other ones, right? And so that's why it's kind of important to uh, you know, key and partition your data appropriately um, so that you have all of the information. If you need some sort of state or history long-term to act on a specific event, like if I need to know all of the other, uh, you know, blue events, you know, the, the, the blue items that have been added to this cart over time, um, it would be nice um, if they're all on the same partition. Okay, so you have to think about how you're partitioning your data so that all of the information you need is on the same uh, partition in use cases like this, right? 
So um, can we keep going? Can we add another consumer? Absolutely. Um, just because we're capped at the parallelism for this topic, you know, three mapped to three, um, you can spin up other consumers with the same consumer group ID, but they're just not going to do anything. Um, and we call these uh, starved consumers. You know, they have no partition assignment. They are very opportunistic. They are simply waiting for one of the other consumers to die. Um, so in the event that, say, consumer three goes down for any reason, um, then consumer four, who is already running and ready to go, the consumer group coordinator can rebalance that partition assignment to another waiting consumer. Okay, so it's flexible. We have some failover here, um, and it's pretty fast in how that happens. Okay, so that's a consumer group. And, you know, we've effectively heard all of the cool things about Kafka. Um, Kafka, you know, the elements at least. Um, but I want to summarize just because it was a lot. Um, it's a distributed event streaming platform, right? We use producers to write events as records or messages into a Kafka topic where they're stored specifically in partitions on specific nodes across the cluster. Um, for added reassurance, we're going to replicate that data from a, a single node in the cluster to other ones um, based on a configurable parameter. And when the data is in Kafka, at any given time, any number of consumers can come and read that data for different purposes in a completely decoupled way. Um, and we can also couple those consumers together to parallelize that processing for a single use case. Okay? And remember that parallelism is capped at the partition level, so that's why it's kind of important to figure out what's the right number of partitions for your use case. So that's Kafka in a nutshell, vanilla Kafka. And I hate using the word vanilla because I feel like there's a negative or like boring connotation about vanilla things, right? But there's a lot you can do with just Kafka, just vanilla Kafka. Um, you can build out a data mesh uh, to throw out some buzzwords. Uh, you can um, implement an entire microservices architecture with just Kafka. It's pretty flexible. It's very powerful. Um, but I also want to showcase some of the other cool things that you can do with Kafka by looking a little more broadly, OK? Because no technology exists in a vacuum. Kafka is no exception. Um, so I want to take a step back and see what other pieces are there to make your real-time use cases just a little bit more sophisticated. So we're going to go back to an example from earlier um, about our schemas, right? So we have our producer. We have a schema. You know, we've done our job implementing a schema. We understand how our data should look and how we want it to look long term. And so when we write our data into the Kafka topic, right, we need to take that object, serialize it into bytes, and then we can store it in there. Yeah. Now, later on, a consumer is going to come along and re try to read those bytes. And OK, those are just bytes. The consumer doesn't know how that object is supposed to look. And so what do we do? Well, we have a schema from the producer side of things. It would probably be good, ideal even, if the consumer knew what that schema was. But how do I make that consumer aware of that schema? Yeah, sure, I can check it into the repo, and you know, maybe that's a manual step. But I don't like adding manual steps, because then I can introduce errors. Right? I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget to update something, or maybe we're going to copy the wrong thing. Um, so we want to avoid that situation, again, because that adds a layer of coupling between these applications. And we want to keep it as decoupled as possible, right? because Kafka already does a pretty good job at keeping it decoupled. Okay? So this is where something called uh, you know, schema registry comes in. Okay? So schema registry is you know, a third-party tool that sits uh, alongside your Kafka cluster. And it maintains the decoupling between your producing applications and your consuming applications by storing these schemas um, that these, these consuming and producing applications can make use of. Okay? Um, so there's a couple different implementations of schema registry, but they all kind of have the same uh, constructs. So um, again, it lives outside of your Kafka cluster to keep track of your schemas and any related metadata. Um, it allows for different schema compatibility levels. And so you can keep track of how you are upgrading your schemas and how you need to upgrade uh, your producing applications or consuming applications over time. And again, they're going to maintain that decoupling because rather than have me sit in the middle uh, and mess something up, schema registry is going to programmatically allow you to update your schemas and give uh, access to those schemas to your different clients. Okay? So how does it work? Well, so we have our producer. Um, the producer, based on whatever topics it's writing to, whatever data it is writing, whatever schemas it needs to have access to, it's going to maintain a local cache just set up efficient, you know, to be a little more efficient. Okay, um, so say we're you know we're writing these cart updates, and maybe this is the first time that producer is uh, writing to that specific topic. So maybe that um, that schema doesn't exist in schema registry. So the producer is first going to check its local cache 
does this schema align with any other schemas that I currently have? And if not, it's going to register that schema in schema registry, okay? As it does that, schema registry is going to give that consumer a schema ID that identifies this version of schema for a specific topic, okay? So say this is schema version zero for the cart updates topic. All right, so the producer's gonna update its cache. It now has that mapping of schema ID to uh, schema. And it's going to use that to deserialize serialize those bytes, write it uh, when it writes it into that Kafka topic. Now on the consuming side of things, remember we're reading these raw bytes. Um, the consumer is also gonna keep a local cache of schemas available. Because the consumer is uh, schema registry enabled, it knows when it reads those raw bytes that um, it's searching for a schema ID. And I forgot to mention something, and that is when the producer writes those raw bytes into the topic, it's going to prepend that chunk of bytes with the schema ID, okay? And so the consumer knows to look for that schema ID when it reads those raw bytes, and it's gonna use that ID to access that schema either from its local cache or from schema registry directly, um, and then it can use that to deserialize that into the original object, all right? It adds another layer in there, but the good news is, is that this can all happen automatically, programmatically. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to introduce any human aspect to make this happen, okay? And so now we can ensure that um, our schemas are actually adhered to and that all of the clients that need access to that schema can get access to it. So now that we can ensure the quality of our data um, and the format of our data, things can get a lot more interesting for our Kafka systems. Um, and the next thing you might want to do as you're working with Kafka and introducing it into your architecture is integrate it with other things, right? Because it's very, very rare that you're starting from zero and just using Kafka. <laughs> no one's going to do that. Um, if you have that ability, please talk to me because I'm really excited to hear uh, how simple things are going to be for you. But um, more often than not, you're going to be integrating with some sort of legacy systems, other databases, other systems in, uh, across your organization, okay? And so we do that with a tool called Kafka Connect, right? Because when we're building out real-time systems, we want everything to be in Kafka because then it can be a lot more efficient to join different streams of data, to enrich uh, you know, streams that are coming in with other reference data sets if you need to, um, and you know, just enrich them for, for different use cases. So we wanna bring as much of the data from our ecosystem, from our, our system into Kafka before we do our processing. And so Kafka Connect is gonna help you do that. Um, as the name implies, it's a way to connect Kafka with other systems. Um, we can treat them as you know, sources or sinks on the other side of things. Um, when you run Kafka Connect, you know, it's, a, it's a framework for identifying how you pull data and how you move data in and out of Kafka. Um, so on the source side of things, we can uh, define a configuration to periodically pull data from a, a specific database, from an API, and I'm working on this word, uh, eventify it, right? Effectively make that data events so that we can then use it in our event-based systems. And on the other side of things, we can move data from Kafka into like S3 or some other, you know, a time series database to use it for maybe further, uh, cheaper analysis, right? So again, it's a framework um, for moving data in this way, defining how you actually move the information. And so it provides a way for you to uh, configure and define individual connectors for pulling and writing these individual tasks. Um, and anybody can implement a connector, right, for any sort of data system, data source or sync that you need. Um, but you don't have to implement one. Um, there's hundreds of connectors out there pre-written for you. Um, this is just a handful of them. So you can move data between these systems in Kafka pretty easily. And all you do is just point to how do, how do I uh, connect with your database, um, how often you want to pull your data, which tables do you want to query and bring into Kafka, uh, what table do you want to write to, um, and then you run the connector, okay? And so how does it do this? Well, with exactly the things we talked about, consumers and producers, right? So it's all sort of layered on top of the uh, initial building blocks of Kafka. Um, so source connectors reading from databases are going to use a producer and producing that in the Kafka, and sync connectors are going to use consumers to read from Kafka and then uh, move it out into your downstream systems. And now that we've seen how to keep track of our data, how to bring data into Kafka as well, um, the next thing you'd wanna do to build your systems out is actually process your information, right? Um, how do we actually do stream processing? 
And so there's a lot of different ways that you can do this within Kafka. You can also do it outside of the ecosystem with completely different technologies. Um, but first, I want to show you what your options are for stream processing in Kafka. So you could just use the consumers and producers, right? For that sort of, you know, the hand wavy business logic that I said our consumers were implementing. Great, you can write a consumer to read data out of Kafka, do whatever processing you need to do, and then maybe produce the result back into Kafka. That's fine. Um, for stateless processing, that's an easy thing for you to do. But when you start to add state, when you need to aggregate data, um, you have a lot of questions to answer for yourself. Um, what do you want to do when the machine goes down? Right? Where are you putting that state? Does it matter if you store it long term? Is it good enough to just keep it on the local machine? Um, yeah, you just you have to answer questions <laughs> and know what your plan is in those specific situations. So while the consumer and producer API is very flexible in what you can do at that level, um, there's a lot of extra steps that you have to go through to make sure that your state and your, your fault tolerance and your failover mechanisms are in there. So if you're saying you're going to use one of the other options, um, Kafka Streams is a purpose-built library for stream processing. Um, it's built on uh, Java and Scala. Um, and it has a lot of uh, really, really great stateful operations in, out of the box provide, provided to you for aggregating, filtering, mapping, what have you. And the cool things, uh, the whole thing about Kafka Streams is that um, when you spin up an application, it is built on top of the consumer and producer API. So when you define your inputs to a Kafka Streams application, that's a consumer. And so for any number of instances for a Kafka Streaming application that you spin up, it's going to par potentially parallelize that processing. You're going to get that consumer group coordination to split up the input partitions across the running instances. Um, any stateful operations that you have, um, that state's going to be stored on the local machine, but then it's also going to be committed back to Kafka. Okay, so if you lose all of your applications for some reason, all of your instances, you can pull them back up and it's going to reboot uh, that information, restore that, that state information from Kafka, so you're never actually losing that. Okay, um, and then if you don't really want to define a Kafka Streams application, we also have KSQL DB, which is a SQL wrapper on top of Kafka Streams. So again, it's all sort of building on top of each other. Um, but then there's more than just Kafka. Um, there's a lot of other uh, technologies, frameworks that you may have heard of for stream processing. Um, these are just some of the ones that I've encountered recently. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what stream processing framework you should use. <laughs> like, there's a lot of different reasons, pros and cons to each of them. Um, and all of these are going to integrate really, really well with Kafka. And there's many, many more out there for you to, take, uh, to make use of. Um, but as you're exploring different stream processing applications and, and technologies, Keep in mind that there are trade-offs. Um, some of them aren't true streaming uh, technologies. Some of them are like micro-batching. So you just got to be aware of you know, what you actually need out of your stream processing before you commit. But the cool thing is, is that you don't have to commit because the data is in Kafka. And while the data is in Kafka, like I said, you can have any number of downstream applications making use of the same information. So while you're trying to shop around and figure out what technologies work well for a given use case, you can, you're free to build out POCs, uh, any number of them that you need to, to make sure that you're using the right tool for the right job. Um, so what now? OK, I've given you all the Lego pieces. Now let's shop around in the store. What can you do with Kafka? Um, I just want to highlight a couple of cool use cases just so you know that we span industries here. Um, I think one of the most compelling use cases for real-time data with Kafka is financial services. Um, I worked in this industry with Kafka Streams for a while, so we were building uh, stream processing on top of market data. So you if you understand the sort of latency and throughput that we have for that information, um, a lot of banks will use Kafka for that. So it can handle this high throughput uh, and low latency environment that you need. Um, IoT and manufacturing. Um, so if you're familiar with like sort of you know, manufacturing lines, um, in a given factory, there will be dozens, hundreds, thousands of sensors for every stage of processing on a, on a specific line for making an object. Um, and usually that stays within a factory. But that's not always good enough. Like we've seen a lot of use cases where instead of just leaving that data there, we can instead write it to Kafka and then have all of the different factories communicating. We can have a lot of different analytics on top of that and maybe integrate it into our uh, supply chain to reorder raw materials um, that much more efficiently or update inventory, again, uh, you know, up to the second you know, granularity there. And then, again, like inventory systems. I've seen a lot of um, use cases where businesses have their entire catalog of inventory stored in Kafka because you can use Kafka just as a database. It takes a little finagling, but you can do that. 
Um, but this could just be one small component of a broader you know, microservices architecture where every stage of you know, the ordering or manufacturing process um, is, is uh, built into Kafka and handled in Kafka. All right, so I know I feel like I kind of almost went a little bit over. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is Kafka. I know that was a lot of information to absorb at once, um, but now you at least have an idea of what the individual components are. Maybe I've given you a little bit of inspiration. And so, yeah, I want to encourage you to just play around with it. You know, it's like, it really is like getting just a, a, just a random box of Legos and just seeing what you can make with it. Um, Kafka is flexible. It's also fun. So I would encourage you, if you're not already using it, um, maybe consider bringing it into your next like pet project um, or take it back to work with you. So um, here I have a link to my link tree, which has a number of resources for, um, you know, things that I find interesting in Kafka generally and also a link to Confluent Developer, which we have uh, dozens of free courses ranging from introductory to reiterate some of the stuff you saw today to way more advanced if you want to dive into Kafka internals. So I hope we'll check it out. And I will probably have to take questions uh, out and about, but I, I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.